Welcome to Roybush 103. Before moving on to fakes, stubs and mocks, we're going to have a quick session where we're going to write a couple of tests to show you the process of working with Roybush. Now I tend to follow a TDD, Test Driven Development Model of Development. Test Driven Development is actually a development activity. Um, I think by this uh, point it's well understood that it's not just for testing but it's to help one write their code in a more efficient manner. But I'm not going to go into uh, the TDD methodology or TDD techniques. You don't need to use Roybush in a TDD manner, uh, but I think given that it's so much more efficient to write short tests and to fire up the entire application you're working on each time to verify something has changed or to verify that your code, your assumptions and your patterns are correct, I would expect that you're going to find yourself increasingly reliant on the test framework as you write your code as a means of uh, actually engineering. So, without further ado, let's imagine we're writing a service for our, our videos. I'm going to start by writing a module called video module.brs. And when I work like this, I tend to have the code I'm working on up here and then I'll have a test down here. So let's write a test. The name of the file isn't important because Roybush uses annotations. Whenever I write my tests, I like to use this syntax. It's not necessary, but I have a mnemonic showing the short name of the namespace. And this will get output in my Roybush test report. It's important because WriteScript unfortunately has no means of namespacing, so this makes it easy to avoid collisions. I generally work with my tests down here and with my code up here. So before I do anything else, I generally come up with a for each function for my entire test file. In this function, I'm going to assign my module This will then be available in all of my further test cases. If I was to run this now, I'm going to get a runtime error because I don't have a module. So let's go ahead and create that. It might be that my module has some kind of dependencies, such as some constants, or perhaps a, uh, a HTTP service that I have somewhere else. So let's take those in as arguments. And the first test I will write will be a group test to test the construction. And we want this test to fail. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure this is the only thing that I'm running. Samples, let's just see, make sure the only one running in here. I'm going to get rid of my onlys in here because I don't want to see any other test output. So let's execute our tests and we should see that we're now running only one test from, from here. <clears throat> Here we have a runtime error, and this is a perfectly valid error because I'm creating my module but not passing in any dependencies. So let's just go ahead and add these. It might be that I'm working in a project where I've already got a get constants and an end of B. 
But as it goes for the scope of this test, I don't have those. So I'm just going to create empty associative arrays. And we'll run the test again. I store references to all of these in my before each because it means I can manipulate them during my tests. We can see here that our test failed in line 18. Line 18 is an exact failure. So what we're going to do now, we're going to just basically test to make sure that our constructor has worked. I'm going to add the most easy assert that I can, which is to assert the equality of some of the variables on my module. So let's check that m.module.constants did in fact get set and uh, constants. And we'll do the same for the HTTP service. And here we can see that these weren't set for some reason. So let's just check what's going on. This is saying that on line 18, m.module.constants wasn't set to equal uh, m.constants. And this is why this is why things like this are so important to do in BrightScript. This isn't something you want one of your customers to find out when executing your app. In this case, we can simply look back at line nine about before each where we created the module and identified that we've misspelled m.constants thusly. Good test coverage will make sure you don't get these kind of runtime errors which will ruin the user experience and make them not like your app. So again on line 18, we're seeing m.constants is still not coming in with a value. So I'm gonna check in here as well. Ah, and there's a very good reason for that. These are private variables in my module and here I'm accessing them without the private marking underscore. I don't know about you guys, but I like having unit tests to test even most basic of things, so I know that every assumption I'm making is good for the rest of my tests. Now, let's imagine we're gonna write a video service, which goes off and gets some videos. So I'm gonna go and write another group. Imagine method called test get videos. We can call this a basic test as well. At this point, I'm going to put an at only on this group because this is the only thing I want to see test output for. Because it's the only thing I'm currently working on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some videos back videos. <coughs> then I'm going to assert that they're not invalid. So let's run that test. What we're going to expect is a runtime error because we didn't just we didn't define the get videos method. And that's exactly quite right. So we're going to define that method now. This one fails because we can see on line 31 of our test we was expecting videos returned from here to not be invalid but in fact was invalid. So we can fix that straight away. Okay, our test passes but it's not really doing anything yet. It might be that I'm actually expecting to see a few bits of, a few blobs of JSON in my videos. And I might expect to see five elements in there. So let's change this to such something more useful. Let's say we're expecting to see three videos. Let's run the test again. And 
and we can see that on line 31 we failed because we didn't have three videos in our collection. So when we're running our video service, we're probably going to go and get our videos from somewhere. It might be we do something along the lines of our results sequence, if we say we start uh, our JSON with a, an, an endpoint somewhere. And maybe some particular argument, like um, an identifier for our account or something. Perhaps that's a, a provider ID or an API key. Now, if we execute this at this point, it means we're going to have to configure our HTTP service and actually go off to the internet and retrieve the videos, which is a valid integration test, but I find integration tests not to be a particularly useful way to quickly and rapidly test all of the code branches in my code. So, Roybush has some provisions for mocking and for stubbing services. We're going to come on to those more in the next video. But for now, what we're going to do is instead of hitting that service, I'm just going to comment that out and hard code in a result just for now. And in the next video, we're going to expand upon how we can actually mock and stub calls to other functions in our system. So imagine that we're going to say, of I and name do it right. Now, if we to run this code, oh, I forgot. We can see we've now got three elements coming back. We could do some even more advanced tests on these things. We can say assert, um, we could take an individual object out of the array and we can test that, or we can say array contains AAs. Now, when we do this, we can say we're going to pass in the videos array and we're going to say we expect it to contain the following associated arrays. So I can say I actually do expect it to have at least one element which has ID of and we can see the packet test passed. To make sure that's the case, I'm going to put something in here to say wrong ID. As we can see, we didn't create any videos with a JSON blob with a field called wrong ID. So let's run this test and see what happens. You can see straight away that on line 32, which is here, we couldn't find anything in the videos collection which had the missing value of wrong ID with, with a key wrong ID in the value video one. Now what we can do is we can actually provide all the values we're expecting. and make sure that they're all present. Now this is a really useful way to verify data there that you really expect. So for example, I'm expecting a type to be video. Imagine if I expected a type to be music for video one. I get a failure there because on line 32, it was expecting me to have a type music for the idea of video one. So let's go back to video and run our test again. You 
you can see everything passes fine. Now this can get very flexible and very powerful very quickly. It might be that our Get Videos API accepts a type which goes beyond video. Maybe we can specify we want an MP4, in which case our service will go off and only retrieve MP4 videos. Now that was the case, we can either run an integration test or as I would prefer running with stub data and we can ascertain that the video types are coming back wrong. In this case, we'd be expecting MP4 type video for video one. Let's go back here. It might be that we can actually parameterize this test and say we're expecting tests, we're expecting the following, we might say we're expecting three videos when we get MP4 types, or two videos when we're doing an MPEG, and one video when we're doing And then we can parameterize this test by saying expected count and we can then use these parameters as the input arguments for our function, but then also use these parameters in order to validate the data that comes back. So now our basic test is very quickly giving the, the application quite a stretch. And we can see we're getting three MP4 back because the test code that we wrote, the simple implementation, achieves that. But we, we can also see that the test then fails on line 34 for when we do the parameters with MPEG and line uh, 34 again for when we do the parameters with VA. Now I'm going to make a very contrived test here, a very contrived bit of logic because my point isn't to write a whole video service, it's to demonstrate how the unit testing framework writes. So I'm going to say video count is equal to four if that was to these are really contrived values because I'm up um, really early in the morning running these tests before my kids wake up so let's run that and see what we get and we can see we got a pass for everything except for uh, MP VPA failed because we're expecting one, and obviously, I think uh, the video count there is, should be two as well, I guess. It's quite a weird. So I wouldn't have shared anything in that case. This is where only params comes in really handy because I'm sleepy, I don't like my coffee or any breakfast, I'm not thinking straight. So I'm gonna put only params on there. And we're gonna work out why this isn't playing ball. Okay, so uh, type VPA IDs V1. So that value's missing, but it had enough values in this. So let's have a look and see what's actually coming back. And this is a really nice thing about only params, makes it really easy just to put stops into your code and take a look at what's going on. So 
So we do have videos there. Um, if we go zero VP8, we're just expecting VP8. Ah, because we're expecting the video ID of one. Okay, so I'm going to just change that test to the lowest common denominator test. And there's other things we could do there. Um, I'll get rid of that stop. And what we'll do, we're going to make this test a bit more advanced in a second. Okay, so now we get rid of the only, and we can see that we're getting all of the data back. So how can we go about testing these additional IDs? <clears throat> well, one thing we could do is we could put the IDs we're expecting in as parameters. So we could say, for example, add an array here, and say we're expecting, in this case, to have video IDs of video zero, one, two, Here we've got less videos, so lower IDs. And we can pass these in as a parameter to our test. But we need a, a meaningful way of finding out that data set. In all cases, we want to check that our array contains associative arrays with these particular video types which has that video type what we can also do in this case though is and I do this a lot and remember this is a very contrived example I work with big JSON blobs and XML data sets whereby I actually really do want to ascertain that certain video IDs are present in certain cases because that's a very typical use case you know you might want a particular locked content or free content and so um, what I find myself writing a lot is something along the lines of this. I can actually put a uh, an object in here would have the idea I'm expecting and then assert the array also contains those particular objects so in this case I'm going to say specifically well if I'm uh, getting an mp4 I expect three videos back with these IDs if I'm getting an mpeg one two back with these IDs and one with these IDs so I'm going through I'm certain my array contains the count of data I expect and then certain it's got those particular video types, and then I'm going to assert it contains these uh, uh, these specific IDs. So let's give that a test. And see if that does what we need it to do. And we can see there we're good. And we can double check this by we'll just change one of our video IDs to two and run the test again. So we can see that by changing the expected data to wrong value, we uh, we we failed a test on line forty two, which was the assert for that ID. Wherever you can, try not to put asserts inside for loops or inside function calls to other functions, because Roy Bush does some pre-processing trickery to ascertain what line the assert is, and it's super handy to know the exact line an error occurs at. So I I, I urge you. Um, if you find yourself having to write a test in a, a for loop, then raise uh, an issue at the GitHub and I'll write you an assert that does what you want. I'm actually in the process of writing an assert that will make it easy for me to just assert a particular field is present because I, I, I think that'd be very handy if I could just do something like assert um, I think I'd much rather have something like that to test that, that these values are present. So um, but I'm going to be adding that in due course. So as you remember, we've got an only there. Let's get rid of our only on here and here. And then we're going to run our test uh, suite again. Because we were just focused on that. 
and now we can see we're very boldly, uh, very quickly building up our. Oh, <laughs> I left that debug code in there. Let's do that again. Yeah. So we're going to see we've got rid of our only, so we should be running the entire suite again. And you can see how quick it is to start building up tests with Roybush. Um, we're already testing out a whole bunch of scenarios with different values. We're able to very quickly add parameterized tests, and I think the output is very readable. And you've already seen what it looks like when we've got failures, how easy it is to identify the assert that's failed, etc. In our next video, we're going to be talking about fakes, mocks, and stubs. So I hope you guys come back for that. That's, I think, one of the most powerful features in Roybush. I've used it on three production apps, and I've been able, on each of those apps, to double the amount of tests they've written in a year. Um, I've been able to write the same amount of tests in about two weeks using Roybush. Um, more tests means more code coverage. More tests means more time spending in a one millisecond test loop and a four second build cycle than running the entire app. So. I'm hoping by now you guys are beginning to see the benefit and feeling like uh, incorporating it into your own projects and getting on with some very efficient and effective unit testing goodness. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you later.